Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to St. David's on this very, very sunny uh, Sunday morning. It's our uh, live stream Sunday service here at St. David's Episcopal Church, uh, and we are joint, we are partnering today with Resurrection Episcopal Church in Clarkston, and um, I'm Father Chris Yaw, the rector here at St. David's. And I'm Heather Barta, the priest at the Episcopal Church of the Resurrection in Clarkston. We are so excited to worship together on this festive day of Pentecost. Yes, Pentecost is the 50th day after the resurrection, 10 days after Jesus ascended to heaven. Today we mark the coming of the Holy Spirit and uh, the ways that God might be uh, transforming the church. This was a day of incredible transformation for the church, and we look at the ways God is transforming us as well. And looking at the news this week and the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, it has ignited in so many of us a discontent with the status quo, of racial injustice, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, rioting is the language of the unheard. And so I want at the very beginning, we would like to uh, take this time to acknowledge um, our own feelings, to acknowledge uh, this discontent, anger, rage, um, our own sadness for George Floyd, his friends, his family, and for all of us who long to live in a more just, more fair, and more equitable society. And so Reverend Heather, would you lead us as we begin uh, in a moment of prayer. Absolutely. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God, our creator, you created humankind in your image and blessed us with your love. Help us to show that love to one another as we work for equality for all races in education, housing, public services, and employment opportunities. Give us strength and courage to speak out against injustice and to work for the transformation of unjust systems that keep some in bondage, that we may more fully live out your kingdom here on earth and fulfill our baptismal vow of respecting the dignity of every human being. We pray especially for our neighbors in Minneapolis and for all the cities who are protesting the systemic racism that plagues our country. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, your son, who came to set us free. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Heather. And we are reminded of how much transformation awaits each one of us. So this morning, uh, one of the pieces of our worship together will be remembering life's various transformations. Um, as celebrations, so birthdays and anniversaries, which we will pray for later on. And of course, we're going to be celebrating with songs that have a Pentecost theme to them, and perhaps some of you even wore red as part of our commemoration today. That's one of the things I like about Zoom, Heather, is when you mute your mic, it comes up red. So that's just a Pentecost coincidence. <laughs> Good. Well, I'll be, well, I'll be Pentecost even if we're not wearing it in our clothing. We'll also be hearing scripture and songs in the sermon, and we'll be participating in something called spiritual communion. And we're excited to be featuring so many voices from our congregations in the worship this morning. And following our service, we invite you to stick around for our coffee hour um, when our own uh, Dr. Ivy Forsyth Brown is going to be with us. Um, as many of us know, Dr. Brown is the Assistant Professor of Sociology and Director of African American Studies at University of Michigan Dearborn. Um, she's going to join us to offer insight on the developments surrounding the George Floyd death in Minneapolis, what that means to our, um, our nation, what that means to us. So I please, uh, after our worship, uh, stick around for coffee hour. Definitely, that'll be a great conversation to have. A few tips if you are not familiar with Zoom. Uh, first, if you are able, turn on your camera so that we can see you and see each other. Uh, and regarding your microphones, you are all muted. Uh, and we advise that you stay muted um, so that the background noise and the extraneous noise behind you doesn't come through. And you're invited to follow the prompts on the screen. Uh, feel free to say the responses out loud and join in the singing uh, wherever you are. Uh, it may wake up your neighbors, um, but uh, you're on mute. So make a joyful noise. Absolutely. Also in the chat box, please use it to enter two things. Uh, first, any life celebrations, birthdays or anniversaries in the month of May. Uh, we have a list and we do apologize if we missed you somehow, but please list those in the chat box. You can find that along the bottom. You can just click where it says chat and you can send that to everyone. 
And the other thing to list in that chat box is um, our prayer requests that will be spoken later in our service. So for whom or for what do you pray? And, and let, <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just going to, I was just going to say, no. uh, let's, uh, let's enter now into a moment of, um, of center oh, no, and quiet. No, Chris, so for whom or for what do you pray? Oh. And then at Resurrection, we have been spending a lot of time talking about gratitude. So for whom or for what do you offer gratitude? So you can enter any of those um, pieces into the chat box and we'll be able to pray them together later. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, so now let us enter into a moment of centering quiet as we prepare to offer our hearts and our minds, our thanksgivings and our prayers unto Almighty God, who is here uh, with us on this Pentecost celebration, which we pray is unlike any other uh, in its transformative effect on your life and on mine. For Jesus is here and he's here to be worshiped, to be praised um, and to spread that love around the world. Thank you for being with us on this Pentecost day. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly Give you 
thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, who on this day taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things, and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts. Le jour de la Pentecôte, ils étaient tous ensemble dans le même lieu. Tout à coup, il vint du ciel un bruit comme celui d'un vent impétueux. Et remplit toute la maison où ils étaient assis. Travail, chapitre 2, verset 3 et 4. Là, ça, il y a une bonne langue, paraît tant que tu flammes du fait, qui sépare une à l'autre et puis qu'elle pose graine par graine sous tête de chaque. Il y a tout le monde qui est pour voir le Saint-Esprit et puis il y a pour parler l'autre langue d'après Jean l'Esprit bon Dieu. Jesus Christ, Jerusalem, all the holy people, look come back. Ebo bewe wo hani ne naro, oju kure ha anya, ha si le ndi ani ne ndi ne puku, ha buk ndi Galilee. Ole otu anyi si anu onye obula na asusu nke anyi nke amuru anyi ni ime ya partos medos elamitas y residentes de Mesopotamia, Judea y Capadocia, Pontus y Asia, Frigia, Pamfilia, Egipto y las partes de Libia pertenecientes a Sirene y visitantes de Roma, tanto judíos como prosélitos. Cretan and Arab in a fui una language we are hearing them talk about God deed of power. All are we amazed and perplexed how we are settled with one another. What does this mean? But them other people skin up them face and say, them drunk. But Peter stand up with the eleven and raise up his voice and say, all your man from Judea and all will live in Je Jerusalem. Let me tell you this, and listen good to what I say. Non enem si cut vos aestimatis hi ebri isunt, cum sit hora diei tertia. Sad hoc est quad dictum est per profitum Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Are bidi pochi chavarum, 
Yevlusin Areni, Nachan Dirochmets, Uparavor or Vakalusti, Anuhedev, Yurakanch or Vok, O Kanchum E, Diroch Anuni, Bri Perkabi. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers, kindle a flame of sacred love in these cold hearts of ours. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the great and wide sea with its living things too many to number, creatures both small and great. There move the ships, and there is the Leviathan, which you have made for the sport of it. Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers, kindle a flame of sacred love in these cold hearts of ours. All of them look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them and they gather. You open your hand and they are filled with good things. Thirty, you hide your face and they are terrified. You take away their breath and they die and return to their dust. Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers, kindle a flame of sacred love in these cold hearts of ours. You send forth your spirit, and they are created, and so you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers, kindle a flame of sacred love in these cold hearts of ours. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please him. I will rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Spirit, heavenly dove, with all thy quickening powers, kindle a flame of sacred love in this cold heart of ours. A reading from 1 Corinthians. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activa activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. 
to another the discernment of spirit, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually just as the spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Upon the mountain, my Lord spoke. Out of his mouth came fire and smoke. Looked all around me, it looked so fine. Asked my Lord if all was mine. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, Jordan River is chilly and cold. It chills the body, but not the soul. There ain't but one train that runs this track. It runs to heaven and right back. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I A reading from the Gospel according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One day... A caterpillar and a butterfly were sitting on a leaf. Fancy wings you got there, said the caterpillar. Yeah, you're going to get them one day yourself, said the butterfly. Not if I can help it, said the caterpillar. I'm too, busy, busy, I'm too busy building this fort, and he pointed to a half-built chrysalis hanging on a nearby branch. I spend half my days worried about getting eaten up by a frog or a bird. And once my new home is ready, I'm going to crawl inside. I'm going to seal that door shut. I'm going to curl up and take a big nap and forget all about the stress and strain of this crazy life. Sounds like a good idea, said the butterfly. But life has its own ideas. And what you're planning as an escape might actually be a transformation. Welcome to Pentecost, my friends, the church's annual celebration of a regular holiday that turned into a crazy transformation that turned the world upside down. And it comes at a time when you and I are cocooning ourselves, tucked away in our safe spaces, doing our safe things on retreat from a dangerous world outside, longing for a return to normalcy, whatever that's going to look like, which is why we ask, in what ways may our escape precede a transformation. 
Many of us have some inklings about our transformations as restrictions ease up. We'll be doing more things like this online. We'll be packing masks whenever we leave the house, and it'll be a long time before we find ourselves in big crowds of people. But like those first disciples who gathered at Pentecost, we may very well have no idea of the size and scope of what God has planned, of the new world that awaits, like that clueless caterpillar climbing into its safe house. Who knows what wonder awaits us, what the world will look like, what we will look like when we emerge. So what do we do in the meantime while we're in the cocoon? What does Pentecost show us about all this? Well, in our reading from the book of Acts this morning, great to hear so many languages, wasn't it? We find this group of disciples, they're gathered because Jesus had asked them to wait, to watch, and to pray for the next chapter to be birthed. They gathered in a circle of the safety of trusted friends in a familiar city on a familiar occasion. But while they waited, they kept busy. And what did they do? They were obedient, they were hopeful, and they were prayerful. What are you and I to do in our COVID-19 holding patterns as we trust God for the next chapter to be birthed? It may be to be obedient, to be hopeful, and to be prayerful. One of the big differences between my 18-month-old little, little guy and my 10-year-old is that the little guy pretty much does what he's told, while the older guy always stops and asks why. Some of it, is that right, James? Some of it is pretty simple stuff. When a parent asks, you know, grab an umbrella, why? Because it might rain. Grab an extra bottle of water, why? Because you might get thirsty. But it gets difficult as time goes on. Empty the dishwasher, why? Because I said so. Well, at the root of obedience is this understanding that the one telling us what to do knows what's going on, knows what's best, and has a plan worth following. When you and I seek to be obedient to God, we believe all those things, that God knows what's going on, God knows what's best, and God has a plan worth following. What does obedience look like to you and me in this period in our lives? Are we being obedient to what we believe and who we are? Are we being obedient to the promises we've made and the good voices that you and I hear how is our time in the cocoon one of obedience? Out on a walk earlier this week, it was trash day, and, and for some reason I noticed an inordinate number of cardboard wine boxes and empty beer cases stuffed into several neighborhood trash cans. It's no secret, many of us have been enjoying our cocktails during uh, this time in our cocoons. But as we know, alcohol is classified as a poison and as a depressant. So if we've noticed in the wider community an increased sense of depression or hopelessness or despair, well, we're not alone. We can only imagine those early disciples who were gathered in that upper room, having seen the head of their organization ascend into heaven and for them to be left leaderless. Oh yes, we know the team was not stacked with well-connected government, political, or corporate figures. Those early disciples were plain average folk for the most part, and what did they do? They cultivated hope by remembering Jesus. Just like you and me, they had a story of gruesome arrest, torture, death, and burial, and then they had Easter. They saw the amazing power of God turn absolute hopelessness into victory. They had hope, and I would say, my friends, this morning, so do we. And so we ask ourselves inside our cocoons, what does hope look like? Are we trusting in the promises of God's care for us? Are we remembering that God says no matter where we go, no matter what we do, God is with us and God will take care of us? How are we using this time in the cocoon not to grow depressed, but to cultivate that hope? My friend Scott is a grandfather, and he loves spending time with his eight and 10-year-old grandchildren. And uh, he likes taking them up on vacation in the woods to his cabin. And when they get up there, they, um, they do a lot of outdoor stuff. And one of the things he's taught them is something called the quiet game. What's the quiet game? Well, he takes them out to the back porch, and they sit there, and they listen in silence. And then each one of them, they go around in a circle telling each other what the other one is hearing. There's a robin, there's a duck, there's a tractor, etc. 
Well, one night when they were playing, it was the eight-year-old's turn to speak up. And uh, so her grandpa said, what do you hear? The child didn't respond. So grandpa asked again, what did you hear? Shh, said the eight-year-old. It's a tiny little tree frog. And he's praying, so be quiet. This imaginative little one knew that in the quiet of the evening, it's a good time to pray. In the quiet of our cocoons, it's a good time to pray. It's a good time to take stock of what's around us, to talk and to listen. And what do we pray for? What percolates up as we play the listening game with what's going on around us? Well, shall we pray for an end to white police officers killing black people? Shall we pray for ways we might change the only thing we can, which is ourselves, and that means our own attitudes and our actions that contribute to America's original sin of racism? Shall we pray for ways to speak out and stand up when persistent injustice makes a mockery not only of our nation, but of our faith as well? Prayer will make us more aware of God and hopefully more aware of what's going on in the world and what's going on inside of us. Prayer will help us cry the tears that God cries when God sees pain and suffering and injustice. Prayer may sound passive, but prayer is actually a very active activity. It leads to action when we do it right. Action may be education. How can we educate ourselves? Education can lead to transformation. Prayer leads us to that place where God awaits and God communicates and where God is seeking our own transformation. I don't know about you, but I want to be different a year from now. I want to be more sensitive to those in need. I want to be more generous. I want to be kinder. Um, there are a lot of things that I need to be transformed of and into. I wonder what that might look like for you. How might prayer be a prelude and a preparation for the transformation that is on its way? Friends, we are here in our cocoons, stuck in this COVID-19 suspended animation for God knows how long. The world is in disarray. There's an unpredictable future before us. We await the next chapter of the Spirit's work. And I would say that Spirit's working right now. And we use this occasion of Pentecost to remember the transforming power of God's Spirit. And so what can we do during this time? We await, we wait in that upper room with those disciples standing by in our cocoons in obedience, in hope, and in prayer. What are some things we could do to make those things more profound, more encompassing, more integral into, um, integral to our lockdown lives? And finally, you may have noticed this word in our readings uh, four times in the collect and in the psalm, et cetera. It's this word rejoice. We can never forget that there is joy in following Christ. There is joy because we know that what awaits will find its culmination in God and in love. As we wait in hope, God is at work. As we may wait in mourning, as we wait in lament, we can never forget the joy that awaits us. For God is at work. God is busy as a bee, consumed with the task of renewing and revitalizing and recreating this marvelous world, one which was created for God's joy and for ours. My brothers and sisters, let us be obedient, hopeful, and prayerful as the next chapter unfolds. Amen. Let us declare together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Dear Lord, open our eyes to the ways you are transforming our world and our lives. Help us to be obedient, hopeful, and prayerful as you lead us into a new chapter. Let us pray for those who help us remain faithful. We pray for Bonnie, our bishop, plus our bishops Michael, Justin, and Francis, for Chris, our priest, for George, Kitty, Susan, Lynn, Tom, Steve, and for all the holy people of God. Let us pray to the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Lord, leading through this time of pandemic is difficult, so we pray for our leaders. Donald, our president, our representatives and senators, Gretchen, our governor, and Ken, the mayor of Southfield, and Eric, the mayor of Clarkston. May peace and justice guide all of their decisions and actions. Let us pray to the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. We pray for an end to the coronavirus pandemic and offer these prayers to you. Almighty God, who began your work of creation with nothing, help those devastated by COVID-19 to start over. Be with the sick and dying as they daily awaken to new landscapes. Guide brave health care professionals facing unemployment. Help company owners and workers whose livelihoods have vanished and encourage all who have hit rock bottom to look to you and not lose heart. Awaken us to the new colors and blank canvases around us. And we dare pray for your power within us to take over and guide our hands in painting your masterpiece. Let us pray to the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose rage over injustice upended tables in the temple, Guide our anger and outrage over the murder of George Floyd. Raise up protesters who will be known not for looting and violence, but for effective pressure on unjust systems. Inspire legislators to spurn partisan politics in favor of real fairness and change. Awaken police departments to end brutality and racial oppression. And may our discontent fuel the searching of our own souls that we might put to death in us the things that led to George's death. This we ask of the one who finds life in every death. Let us pray to the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Lord Jesus Christ, who knows the pain of mourning, the sting of death, and the hope of resurrection, be with the victims, families, and friends of the 100,000 people who have died from the coronavirus. Comfort the dying, strengthen aid givers, and encourage the distraught. Help us honor the dead by reaching out to the living 
especially the vulnerable, lonely, and depressed, not only in comfort, but in finding a cure that your work of bringing life to the world may be complete. This we ask in the name of the one who triumphs over death, Christ our Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Lord, thank you for holding together our wonderful congregation through this time and in the way you inspire us to give back by making medical masks, feeding the staff at St. Anne's Mead, and for your grace in running our food pantry. We pray for those who are homeless, hungry, and unemployed. Let us pray to the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit We pray for fellow parishioners on our parish cycle of prayer and those on our parish prayer list, especially those who are ill. Feel free to name them silently. We pray for the 100,000 people in the United States who died from coronavirus, especially the approximately 5,400 people in Michigan. And we pray for all who have died in the hope of the resurrection. Please feel free to name them silently. Blessed are those who give meaning to our lives. Holy and precious is the example they leave behind. We pray. May our sorrows diminish as we recall their strength. May their wisdom protect us and help us to live. Let our grief be transformed into tenderness for those who are still with us. Amen. And let us pray for those uh, whose names have been given to us this morning. Uh, referring to the chat box, and Angela Campbell asked for prayers for safe travels for her mom and gratitude that she'll be able to see her today. Haven't seen her since December. That's wonderful. Uh, Johnny Milton asks that we continue to pray for Edith and Eddie more so. Um, and let's see, we're going to get to some anniversaries in just a bit. Um, we'll pray for Jules uh, Klaus. Uh, Christy puts that in there, her neighbor who just uh, received news. His cancer has spread. So remember Jules in our prayers as well this morning. Uh, in gratitude, Jan Ernst for her daughter and her daughter's uh, safe move this week from Connecticut um, to Bloomfield. We're happy for Julie in that move. Edna uh, wishes a birthday blessings, which again, we'll get to in a moment. Maury Mahar prays for the easing of anxiety and those re-entering the world from quarantine. And to give thanks for being able to continue working during this time. Uh, and uh, as I think many of us join her in giving thanks for this sunshine. Uh, prayers for, uh, from Kathy Graham, prayers for Jill Graham, daughter-in-law, uh, that she might recover quickly. Prayers from Walter Edwards in gratitude for the birthday of his son, Walter, who turned uh, 38 on May 4th. Prayers for the family of Cindy Watson, a former principal of uh, Vandenberg School. Many of us knew her, and she died on Thursday, so prayers for her and her family. Uh, George Cullen reminds us that we might pray for victims of all state-sanctioned violence. Uh, from Melissa in celebration of great-granddaughter, uh, excuse me, of granddaughter uh, Nev's uh, daughter Christine's and uh, her birthday. 27th anniversary as well. Gratitude for her son's return to work. Um, let's see, Carol and Bill Collins, we'll get to you guys in a second. You had a big anniversary yesterday. Walter Edwards prays for courageous people who go out and demonstrate peacefully against police brutality, against Blacks uh, and other minorities. They risk their lives for social justice. From Kristen, with thanks and gratitude for our gardens, green spaces, trees, and plants. From Lori, prayers for Kevin Lee, brother of George Lee. Happy birthday to mom, Delphine Pinson, May 19th. 
And uh, Helen, Helen Thompson says, uh, prayers for our leadership in our country. Erica Gillette reminds us to pray for a solution to the issues we're facing today. Deborah Davis, prayers for um, uh, Michelle and her parents and family. Uh, Boitia says uh, another prayer for leadership as well. And um, praying for wisdom, courage, and compassion for um, our leaders for Edna. And uh, from Edna and from uh, Lori Pinson, a prayer for the soul of Aunt uh, Vernal Dykes, who just died at age 100. And for Anne Lasovich, prayers for members of the Roman Catholic Church who begin to face, uh, begin face-to-face -face services. May the worshipers and especially those leading them uh, be protected from the virus. And uh, we, uh, we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus. Let us pray to the Lord. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit Even though we are far away, our appreciation for one another remains close at heart. Let us take a moment to express our appreciation for one another. May the peace of the Lord be with you. Let us all greet one another by flashing the sign of peace. Good morning, all. Normally at this point in the service, uh, the ushers are passing around the collection plates throughout the congregation. However, due to the pandemic virus that we're enduring, that's not possible. Uh, but with that being said, there are still ways to you, for you to continue with your donations, and we encourage you to do so. The, uh, the first way is by the tried and true mail service. Uh, we collect the mail at the church every day. However, we don't process payments every day. So it may take between uh, seven to 10 days before you see uh, anything reflected in your account. But we ask you to be patient with us uh, as we go through this process. The second way is uh, donating online. If you would just go to our website, uh, stdavidsouthfield.org. Uh, and hit on the donate button, 
you can then make your uh, donations uh, online. Again, thank you for all your support. It's needed now more than ever. Thanks again. And uh, I would uh, think, Jake, that uh, the folks at, uh, at uh, uh, Resurrection would uh, also probably uh, uh, second that. Uh, so if you're from Resurrection, you can send it to St. David's, but we would encourage you to send it to, uh, to your church, and we're so welcome. Uh, yeah, Jake, you know, this is a lot easier for you. I mean, you're not passing a plate. You know, you can just do it from the front. I mean, you're, you, the only pass your, plate you're passing has eggs and sausage on it. It will soon. <laughs> Well, fantastic. Now to the life celebrations. Thank you. I saw some, uh, uh, some, some in our chat box, but we want to remember Bill and Carol Collins' 56-year anniversary. Congratulations. The Millers, 27 years. Um, Eric and Angela Campbell, 10 years. Congratulations. And Bill and Debbie, um, if you're on this, uh, uh, in the service, how many years is it for you all? You can just unmute yourself and, and tell us. And they aren't here. Okay, I got that. Uh, I, I got that uh, through the chat box. No problem. Our May birthdays: Angel Awaram, uh, Ivy Forsyth Brown, Angela Campbell, Betty Creech, uh, uh, Car is it Carly? Uh, Carly Collins, George, Walter, Melissa, Maureen, Michael, Tracy, Jane, Joan, Delphine, Joyce, Jane, and Laura. Uh, happy birthday to you. And, and as we normally do, uh, let us pray for those celebrating um, birthdays, anniversaries, and other life celebrations. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, our hands, excuse me, our lives are in your hands. We thank you for another year of life, another year of marriage, another day to celebrate your goodness. And Lord, we pray for every person on this list and even those that uh, we may have over overlooked, that this may be their best year yet of marriage of life, that you, O oh Lord, would make yourself more real to them this year than ever. Bless them and keep them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 And uh, off to Alex and David Reinstra for uh, the announcements. Good morning and happy Pentecost, everyone. I'm Alex and I'm David. And here are this morning's announcements for St. David's. We'll have announcements for Resurrection Church in a few moments as well. First, if you're new with us this morning, we're glad you're here. And thanks for connecting with us as we go through this lockdown together. As Father Chris said at the beginning of the service, we'll invite you to stick around for coffee hour afterwards when our own Dr. Dr. Ivy Forsyth Brown will be with us. Dr. Brown is the Assistant Professor of Sociology and the Director of African American Studies Program at the University of Michigan, Dearborn. She will join us to offer insight on the developments surrounding the George Floyd death in Minneapolis, what does this mean for us and our nation? So come and join us. For anyone interested or already signed up for our Holy Land trip next January, there's a meeting at noon today on this Zoom account. We will get an update from Father Chris and talk about the upcoming trip. Did you know that St. David's has ways to stay connected throughout the week? Join us tomorrow and throughout the week for 8 p.m. Compline and Coffee Hour. That's Monday through Thursday on our Zoom account. Do you want to come to church during the week? Join us on Tuesday mornings for St. David's Tradition. It's 8 a.m. worship and coffee hour. On Tuesdays, we typically look at the lives of the saints. And this Tuesday, it's the Martyrs of Lyle. Beyond, that's 8 a.m. on Tuesday. This is followed by 9.30 a.m. Bible study on Tuesday morning. We've just started 1 Corinthians, and it's not too late to join us. We'll look at chapter 9 on, at 9.30 a.m. on Tuesday morning again, on this account. Join us for a special virtual happy hour this Friday. Mark your calendar for this Friday, June 5th from 5 to 6 p.m. Bring your favorite alcoholic or non-alcoholic alcoholic drink recipe and we'll play games and have a toast. That's this Friday for 5 p.m. Zoom happy hour. This week is graduation and retirement Sunday. If you're graduating or retiring this year, please contact the office and let us know. You can send an email to lynn at stdavidssf.org. Our food pantry is open every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to noon. Anyone who needs food or wants to donate food is welcome to come between these times. We also have special homemade masks, crosses, and prayer cards to help our customers get closer to God in all of this. We're planning on a special fresh produce event in June. Ken Miller will tell us more after our service. Now remember, 
If you, need, if you have any errands you need run or groceries to pick up or are in need of spiritual support, call Father Chris anytime at 313-585-4840. Do you want to write posts to encourage first responders? St. David's is partnering with the Salvation Army in getting notes to these brave souls. If you would like to write one or more, please drop it off at St. David's between 9 a.m. and 12 by Wednesday. Thank you. Now let's check in with Reverend Heather for announcements from Resurrection Church. Thank you so much. Um, Resurrection is excited to be here worshiping together with St. David. So uh, thank you to all the people that helped make that happen. And uh, for all the people from Resurrection on, um, I'm really glad we made it to the right room. Yay. Um, announcements for us this week. So next week, we'll be back to our regular room. Um, I mean, now you have the way to visit with St. David. So feel free to drop in and visit with them at any time. Um, we'll be back on our uh, regular Zoom room and you'll get several emails this week that tell you about that. Uh, beginning this week, we'll move to noonday prayer happening on Tuesdays at 1230. So that's a schedule change from before, but Tuesdays at 1230, I'll be on Facebook Live doing noonday prayer. I think that those are the big announcements that we have. And uh, thanks again for having us. Hanging out Del with us, worshiping with us. It's, it's a delight to be with you. And uh, now, uh, Ellen, would you lead us in our hymn of praise as we uh, get ready for our spiritual communion? together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
brothers and sisters in Christ, at this time, we are rightly separated one from another and unable to gather around the Eucharistic table to break bread and drink wine. And because it is the desire of God's people to participate more fully in the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us now invite our Savior more deeply into our hearts by praying a prayer of spiritual communion. In union, O Lord, with the faithful at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I present to you my soul and body with the earnest wish that I may always be united to you. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all the love of my soul. Let nothing ever separate you from me. May I live in you, and may you live in me, both in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for feeding us with your holy presence. May it so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imagination, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated unto you. And then use us, we pray, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Easter blessing. Go out into the world. We are ready. Sent as Jesus Christ was sent, gifted and empowered for the common good. Dream dreams, pursue visions, and speak of God's goodness in the words of those who would hear. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you in this Easter tide and always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world to love and serve God and our neighbor. Alleluia, alleluia. Through worship, outreach, outreach and love and for all. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. alleluia.
Hallelujah, friends. Thank you so much for all of your participation today on this Pentecost service. We usually um, stop the stream to Facebook about now, but um, if you have an objection, I'd like to keep it going because we are going to be um, speaking with um, Ivy Forsyth Brown in just a moment. Um, and before we do that, Ken Miller, I would like to check in with you. As you all know, one of the biggest things that we've been doing um, during this uh, during this uh, time of lockdown is supporting our food pantry. And that has actually been growing a lot. And Ken, you're, you've got some things coming up. We're giving away hundreds of pounds of food for, for a produce drop. Would you talk for a second about that? Absolutely. Um, in partnership with Lighthouse of Oakland County, um, we received an e email invitation to a, I a about meeting. It. And what was discussed was that they were going to start a, they were looking for a place to do a fresh produce pickup in South, Southern Oakland County. Um, there were multiple churches on the, um, on the meeting and we are, have volunteered our parking lot to be used as the pickup location Thursday morning, um, 9 AM until 1 PM. Um, there's information on our Facebook page. Um, we are working actually in conjunction with Cana Lutheran church of Berkeley Berkeley First United Methodist Church and Genesis the Church of Royal Oak um, all have committed to providing both material and volunteers to help run this. Um, initially, we're, we're going to have um, a truck pull in. It could be a thousand boxes of prepacked food. Um, this is being done through the um, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture and in cooperation with farmers down in Ohio. Um, people can come in, they'll get um, a 20 pound box of fresh produce. Um, very little contact with as far as um, between us and the people that are coming in. So, Okay, and Ken, how many uh, volunteers do you need and how can people sign up? Um, they can go out to our Facebook page. Um, there is a link there that Steve put up for us. Um, they can also go out to o um, Lighthouse of Oakland County. And I will be putting up a press release that was put out this morning by, o by Lighthouse on our Facebook page page that also has the contact information. Okay, so you just go to Lighthouse, go to volunteer, and then follow the links along there if you'd like to volunteer for this. Ken, thank you very right. much. Uh, every Thursday in June and July, it's looking like for free produce. And August. Up. And August, okay, that's great. Um, and I would like to now welcome to our, um, our coffee hour, if you will, uh, Dr. Ivy Forsyth Brown. Hello, Dr. Ivy. It looks like you're wearing pink, which is a derivation of red, which is a wonderful way to do Pentecost. And uh, th thank you for, uh, for being with us. I'm going to unmute you there so we can. Sure. We Hi, can everyone. Hi. Hey. Um, and uh, Ivy, I, I, I think uh, like many of us, you've probably just been glued to the TV and to other news sources in uh, seeing how the protest for George Floyd, I've got CNN in front of me right now, um, and just story after story, Chicago shuts down Central Business District to only business owners and residents. Minnesota governor apologizes to journalists who were detained during protests. So much going on. Um, demonstrators in Europe now uh, in solidarity with the U.S. are protesting. Um, I guess I'd like to first open it up and ask for your initial comments uh, and observations before I start honing in on questions. This has certainly been spurring a lot of thought on your end, no doubt. Uh, yes, and I'm not really surprised with what's going on. Um, to be honest, I'm monitoring it very lightly because it is overwhelming and slightly depressing for me um, and not necessarily unexpected, like I said. So um, I do know that the British are covering it. BBP, BBC has been covering all of our incidents very um, closely and they've been doing it for some time. So this is much more global as far as who is seeing what's happening here in the United States. Um, it doesn't make us look all that great, but it is understandable because of the longevity of having these issues. Um, this past week has been really quite interesting with the situation that happened in Central Park. If, and those of you should be familiar with the woman who called the police on the black bird watcher who just asked her to put a leash on her dog as necessary in that area of the park. And she took it as an affront that he had the nerve to say anything to her um, and decided to call the police and say he's threatening her life, which is a bold face lie. Now, if we didn't have video of those, that particular encounter, it would be his word against her word or 
if it had escalated into some type of violence, we wouldn't really know what had actually happened in, in the park. But because we have video, there was some action taken and you can see how she has escalated and exaggerated what actually was going on. That, I'm using that in correlation with what has gone on in Minneapolis and then elsewhere. That what we're seeing right now is, is the response to the increased video surveillance that we can use very easily with our cell phones and with police video to see what is really happening. African American community and other minority communities have been complaining about police over surveillance and violence for decades, if not longer than that. And we have not had any type of way of verifying that this is what's going on. The police hold the line or they come up with the story that the person was fighting back, they were doing this, they were doing that. And so we needed this level of force in order to contain or control the situation. Now we're really seeing, it's like, no, that's not exactly what's happening at all times. That quite frequently, the police have escalated a situation that really didn't need to get to that particular level. Um, because minority communities have been experiencing this kind of heavy handed police action for decades, they are very frustrated. Um, and even more frustrated with the last five years since Ferguson of having all of this video come out of all of these African Americans who are largely unarmed and not necessarily doing anything criminal, um, being shot by police officers or being manhandled and ki killed by police officers in various ways. So the video evidence hasn't changed the policy. It hasn't changed behavior. So this is just one more thing really of the issue right now, personally, that I see is we're in lockdown, people are out of work, um, people are feeling the financial stress of this situation. Um, the lockdowns and the COVID epidemic has really hit the African American and other minority communities much harder than the larger white population. And so you have a different level of frustration that's compounded with the fact that they're over policed and heavy handed action. And so these type of protests seem completely expected, um, at least to me, given the current situation. Yeah. What yeah. We're, we're in kind of like um, 1968, that summer when we had um, riots all across the country, where people's expectations of having some type of social change are outpacing what's actually happening on the ground. And people get really upset, and then it boils over into the street. And what you're pointing out, uh, it reminds me of uh, Vietnam, um, Ivy, when uh, all of a sudden we had pictures of what was going on and when yes. people could actually see it. Oh my gosh. And then in, in 67, when you had people being hosed down and you had pictures, um, right. because when you look at these protests, it's not just African Americans. I mean, yeah. it is people are, are reacting all over the place because they're finally seeing, oh my gosh, this is yeah. what we've been hearing, but we haven't seen it like we're seeing it now. Um, I just wonder if, if this is going to change policy. Yeah. So that's my real, you know, kind of focus. There are some changes. I heard that in Seattle, they passed some type of legislation where you it's illegal to call the police on black people being black people. So like you see a black person walking in your neighborhood and the, you know, the white folks call the police and say, Oh my gosh, they're here. They must be casing the neighborhood. It's like, now they're just walking their dog like, but, um, or, or, or they're jogging. Or they're jogging, exactly, like the incident in Texas, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to invite you, I've got a list of questions for Ivy, but I want to invite okay. you to uh, put in a chat box if you've got some questions for Ivy as well, um, so I don't totally dominate this. Um, what do you think is going to help to quell this discontent, Ivy? What, what are we going to have to see? <laughs> um, we're going to have to see the, our politicians taking this much more seriously than they are. 
Mm -hmm. um, and we are going to need to see those people in power to make change, um, not look so much at the response, which is challenging to get past that. No, it's still illegal to go out and break into businesses and loot businesses. That is still illegal behavior. Um, and it should not be happening. The type of violence that we're seeing should not necessarily happen. Um, however, instead of being so heavy handed with the, these people who are protesting, we need to look at what was the cause of the violence in the first place. Why are they so upset? And how can we change those things so that we can preclude having some these incidents continue in the future to take it seriously? Yeah. Um, it, it's very similar. So here we are in southeastern Michigan. And after the Detroit uprising in 67, the um, Johnson administration instituted the Kerner Commission, as many of you should be familiar, to look into what was the root cause of such violent um, uprisings across multiple cities in the United States at the time. The Kerner Commission came, report basically said that we have two societies and that they're separate and unequal. And that was the root problem. And if we weren't gonna be addressing this inequality that exists in society, we're not going to solve the, the, the problem of having discontent at some future point. That Kerner Commission report was largely ignored by most of our politicians. Nothing was done. No policies were changed. The only thing that really did happen was the Fair Housing Act was 1968 and um, uh, several other things that happened after that associated with the civil rights movement. But we changed policy by still, we didn't change policy by changing the way we were policing or surveilling minority populations or the per perceived feelings that when black people are around that something that they're going to do something illegal or that they need to be monitored in a particular way. Um, so until that type of thing, those things change, I don't know. I, I don't see yeah. anything change. However, yeah. okay. I do have to say, however, uh, Father Chris, the however is um, for those of you who've been in my workshops before at the church or at, at um, convention, I still am hopeful, but I've always said that things were going to get uglier before they get better. This is part of the ugly, that we have to wake up to the problem of racism and inequality in the United States. We just have to. And we have to really address it. And the inequality, yeah. when I say that, I mean it very broadly. So inequality across all forms of difference, particularly socioeconomic, and well, as well as race, but also sexuality and other. All of that has to be addressed so that we all have an equal stake in what's going on in the country. Um, yeah, we could just go through the litany, Ivy, of, of, uh, uh, of economic inequality. Um, I, I want to say there's one black senator. 13% of the population is black. Uh, I think 9% yes. of the Congress is, uh, of our congressional reps are black. I mean, just in positions of power, in positions yes. of economic uh, prosperity. And it continues. And it continues. Um, I want to get to a question that Reverend Heather put in the chat box about what can we do? Because I think that's a big question uh -huh. a lot of us have. I think um, for St. David's, I've been quite delighted with you guys, actually. Um, you, uh, you guys are doing fine in many ways. Um, I got a, e a text from uh, a colleague who, I, I don't know if I can find it, actually. She was saying that for white folks, be allies. Check in with your black friends. Ask them how they're doing. Um, and, and really ask them, really mean it, but also educate yourself on what the root problems are. We've done that very well at St. David's over the last four years or so, and that's why I say I'm very contented and, and happy with where St. David's folks are. 
Um, if you have not read White Fragility, I encourage you to read it. That is classic for understanding the kind of denial and dismissiveness that largely white Americans have been having about the race issue for generations. Um, if you haven't read America's Original Sin, uh, which you referenced earlier, Father Chris, um, and we read as a congregation, read it. Um, it is difficult for us to continue as Christians as long as we have such levels of hatred, discrimination, and inequality in our society. And we're not really seeming to address it. Um, hold and your, we've got several. I, I was going to say, hold your representatives to account. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're going to be outraged, which is justified, um, be outraged and contact your representatives and your congressmen um, and tell them that they need to stop playing politics and start addressing real issues. Um, mm -hmm. Those are things that can be done immediately uh, by anybody. So we and don't Reverend, have to wait. Reverend Barda, you had a question? I just wanted to clarify, we aren't St. David's. You also have Church of the Resurrection from- Yes, Clark I do David. know that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have, we have not done a good job uh, in the four years that I've been there of mm -hmm. doing good work around uh, racial equality, um, respecting the dignity of every human being in our baptismal co covenant. So thank you for white fragility. I'll put that out to the group at Resurrection. Um, but do know that we would love to be in that conversation. So if you have some tips, you know, of what we can do, who we should write, what we should say, um, we could use some handholding with that. Uh, okay. If you could support us with that, uh, I am happy to talk with the group about how we could do something. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, um, I welcome the other congregation here. Um, that's wonderful. I would tell you to start first with uh, this original sin by uh, Jim Wallace. So, of course, you know, I have books. I'm always got, I always have books, right? So, and Bishop um, Bonnie Perry just did it as her Bible study. So we well, can even and go that back was, and watch that conversation. Yes, because I suggested it to her. Yay! <laughs> so, um, so yes, you can go on the diocesan website and she has all the materials that they were posted there. Um, I definitely think that that's the first place to go because it gives you the nice historical perspective and context within being a religious community and then go to white fragility, which I will say is a difficult read. So. And there's, a, there's an, a question from RNC here. Have you seen a difference overall in the young people who are students in your class that perhaps color isn't quite so big an issue with the younger as it is with the older? I think that's a really good question because you're in touch with students regularly. Yes and yes and no. I mean, for Deer, University of Michigan Dearborn is a very, very diverse campus. And so on our campus, it's fairly kumbaya, okay? Um, there because of the level of diversity. Uh, from what I hear from other campuses, there's some of that, but not necessarily. Um, the Dearborn campus probably, okay. If we're gonna count Arab, and, Arab Americans and Middle Easterners as part of a, a minority, population. They're classified as white in the United States, but they don't necessarily feel that given the type of, um, of surveillance that their communities have. If we add them to a minority population, Dearborn must be about 30% minority with Asians, Latinos, and African Americans completing that. For most colleges and universities, uh, they're largely predominantly white institutions that may have about 5% uh, minority populations, and that's combining all of the minority groups together. And so things are a little bit different on some of those larger campuses that are less diverse. Um, but to answer the question, what I observe or I'm hearing kind of is that the younger generations are just not understanding what's going on and the persistence of this level of inequality based on race and difference. Um, but I would not say that that's universal. I think it really is contextual. It depends on where you are. 
Okay. Um, I just posted in the chat an article that uh, Len Sackett had shared um, on Colin Kaepernick, be uh, Kaepernick because uh, Walter Edwards, also in the chat box, made a uh, reference to it. And uh, the idea that, um, uh, you know, we're, we're finally seeing why, you know, he, he's not being hired and what's at the root of that and who we are. Yes. Um, and a, a question that comes to mind for me is, is what is it going to take for us to kind of use this, you know, th th this, this time as, as, a, as a learning moment, as, as, a, as a way for us to get over it? I think of it every time there's a school shooting, Ivy. I think, okay, mm -hmm. ah, you know, now we're going yeah, to be it, right? <laughs> about gun control, right? And right. it just kind of withers. And, and I've always thought, well, that's because the people in power really don't want to change things. You know, the people in power. And, 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 but I, I don't want to be uncharitable. Perhaps they mm -hmm. do, but we just really need as citizens because, you know, we have a role too. I mean, we need right. to be demanding these kinds of things, yeah. you know, in voting with our pocketbooks and voting with, you know, at the ballot box and that kind of thing. Um, and and I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think of also the, the movement uh, around the 1% and people were camping mm -hmm. out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is it going to take for fairness to, to, to work here? Um, you know, will things get like they, they were in 67, 68? They might. Um, white supremacy is not going to go away easily. Yeah. There's a lot of individuals who are highly invested in it, um, financially, socially, and otherwise. So it's not going to just wither and die because we say so. We're going to have to fight for it if we want to have a more equitable country. And fight, you know, in a violent type of way. I am saying that we're going to have to be, it's a prolonged engagement and we're going to have to have a lot of heart and persistence in order to dismantle the system of inequality that has existed in our society for 400 years. So I think that what we can do is to be persistent. If you first educate and understand if you act as an ally to people of color um, and to other minority and disenfranchised populations, um, if you write to your congressman, as I said before, they are highly responsive when we actually put pressure on them, but it has to be a concerted effort for a long period of time. Um, they have responded in many ways to things that their constituents say are important to them. So they, don't, they do know how to respond, particularly if they feel threatened, like if they don't respond, that they may not win their next election. Um, I would also say that for folks to start talking with other people in their extended family networks and friendship networks, to encourage them also to contact their um, legislators and congresspeople, to really get a kind of grassroots movement going so that it, there can be actual substantive change. But we can't move on to the next issue. Um, that's part of the problem with our current media environment, that we're all watching all of these different platforms of news. And, you know, this is of the moment, but remember we covered Ferguson for a long pe period of time and you know, for about a good month or two, they went back after the protests ended and checked in and so forth. And then there's something else that happens. And we all become much more concerned with that. If we're really serious, we're not gonna let this go. Um, we're not gonna forget and a month or two months, we're going to persist and continue to kind of meet and discuss um, so that we can actually have change. Well, I like what you're bringing up, baby. I mean, change first starts within us. And when we can get educated, when we can read books, when we can, per, uh, when we can make it a bigger, a bigger blip on our radar screen, and when we can say, you know, this is something I can't put off, I'm going to make time to, um, and, and make that change in ourselves, that comes out. And, and that is, and when enough people do that, that's when we see that, which is why I, I think your suggestions to stay read, you know, to, to read up and to stay educated and informed on this is so important because we really do need to, um, uh, to begin that change within us and not just say, oh, it's back to the, to, to the, normal, to the normal stuff, right? Um, right. And then uh, let's see, from the Wells home, 
Uh, the rage and pain felt by minorities is devastating and being within a church like St. Dave's is comforting. And it would be difficult for me not to have this church family. What can we do to ensure that others who do not have the benefit of St. David's handle this pain? Uh, that's a good question. How do we, uh, I mean, these protests have been so emotional. Um, mm -hmm. I have felt like, I mean, I went to pick up bagels with the kids this morning and, you know, everybody works in there's African American, again, the economic hit on this thing. Um, and I just felt like, you know, being an ally, but I didn't want to be, you know, patronizing. I didn't, I wanted to really say, look, I'm very supportive of this and what's happening. What would you offer as tips, you know, that we might, you know, you, you act as an ally is something that you, you um, are, are asking us to do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I do think you should reach out to other people who, black and white, um, and any other variety in between, uh, to talk with them and talk about this issue. And what I really, it's hard to say that you can do any one particular thing. I, I do think that for, to answer the Wells question, um, you can invite them to come to St. David's on a Sunday morning so that they can see what a diverse church looks like. Um, that might be beneficial to them. Um, you can share with them some of the other materials that we've been using in St. David's over time that address these issues. But you can also just be a friend and, and let them know that you're open, that you're concerned about these issues, that if they want to talk with you about it, that they can and that you're an ear. Um, that's, I, I think that is possibly one of the more important things. I've mentioned this to you guys, to St. David's before and in my various workshops in the, um, at the kitchen. This is now a conversation for white people. Um, until they're ready to talk amongst themselves and say this is behavior, racism's behavior we're no longer tolerating. That the type of blatant white privilege situations that we saw in the Central Park video is stuff that I'm not going to perpetrate and I don't want anybody I know doing it either. Um, we're not going to see the kind of larger change. Years ago um, at a church I attended, the pastor said, you can't legislate morality. And you can't. We have passed laws, we know what's illegal, we know what's not illegal, we know that discrimination is straight up illegal yet it still happens. It happens because the hearts and minds of individuals say it's okay. That they're either not gonna get caught or it's not a big deal or they don't like those people anyway. And so that's the stuff, that's where we are. And what I'm seeing, and as you mentioned earlier, Father Chris, with when you're watching the news that there are white people part of this protest too, is that I, we're starting to hit a threshold where people are saying, this is no longer tolerable. This is not the America I want to live in. This is not the America I thought I was living in. And we have to make a change immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, by the way, I dropped in some um, resources in the chat. So Father Chris, if you saw a whole bunch of stuff for me, that's, there are four different okay. things. I think it's posted. Did it post to everybody? Did you post it to everybody? I didn't see, I I didn't, so. I didn't see it to sure. everybody. Okay. Um, why don't you okay. post that? And then Erica Gillette has a question too. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts of the police peacefully protesting with protesters like they did in Flint? I thought that was great. Um, okay, I'm not seeing why I, my thing has not Oh, oh, I forgot. Oh, there you to go. Return. There we go. Sorry. There you go. Okay, so let me talk about what's in the chat right now. Um, I went into this morning and got some resources for further reading um, that are just online resources from popular media. 
so New York Times, PBS NewsHour, um, and so forth that you may find helpful to put into context some of the situations that we are seeing from the last week. Um, I think it's wonderful for the police to be part of it. That I thought that was quite unique. Um, just the dynamic in many ways from the protesters being in direct confrontation with police and other officials to them understanding, the police understanding that there's some issues that they need to work through. Um, this is not a quick fix. None of what's gonna happen next is a quick fix. There's a lot of re-education that needs to happen, different types of training among police officers, um, different types of policing. Uh, with my colleagues at the university, I deal with um, folks in criminal justice and there's a lot of focus on community policing and how that changes and transforms not only the communities, but the police departments as they can start to see who are the problem people in a community and who aren't the problem people in the community. Yeah. But we have, we moved away from community policing when we um, started to change in many ways our tax system. If there's no money, they don't have money for extra police, and they can't do this hands-on, very in-depth community policing, which is actually healthier for communities. Um, so we have to kind of see this as a larger constructed societal shift that's gonna take some time. I have always told students that I would rather be taxed an extra hundred dollars if I know my taxes are going to something that is useful. Um, like you know, libraries and police and fire and roads that don't have holes in them, you know, fix the potholes. Um, it's fine, but we can't be so uh, we can't be so miserly with that those type of resources. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it, it comes at a community deficit. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to. I'll, I'll share this too. The property taxes in Birmingham, if for those of you who are unaware, are something like, depending on the size of your house and so forth, are something like $16,000 a year, which is absurd. But what does that money go to? It goes to make Birmingham the cute little village that it is roads and schools and great libraries and police and so forth. That's where the money goes. They pay for it. What happens to communities who can't pay for it? So if we talk about Detroit and we, you know, disparage Detroit for not having the type of services that we think that they should have, um, Detroit has about a 40% poverty rate. You can't pay taxes. So we have to start looking at in a much larger way for how we're going to great cities, how we're going to be more equitable, how are we going to share resources? Why, do you, why should you care if Detroit is a great city or not? Um, my internet connection might be a little unstable. It's telling me. You're, okay. you're okay. You're okay. You're okay. okay. Um, let's say this. If Detroit was Chicago, a larger, vibrant city, the value of all of our homes would be higher mm -hmm. because you're in proximity to a vibrant city. Yeah. So there's benefits for sharing and making sure that our communities for the entire metropolitan area are better overall and part of that is making sure that there's yeah. equality very very helpful um what uh reverend heather would you um i'm i'm conscious of the time um and i'm wondering if it might be uh if people would want to stick around and go into small groups for just a little bit and answer and uh get to know one another a little bit better 
Um, and especially around conversation around this, I would like the question, and I won't put it in the chat box because we lose that when we go to small groups, to be what personally has been helpful for you in, uh, in, being more, in becoming more racially aware? Um, what has been helpful for you? And uh, maybe nothing comes to mind, maybe others in your group could answer that. Uh, but I think that, that question would be helpful for us to, to answer. Um, is that uh, something, Heather, we want to do? I would invite, yeah, I would invite us at least just to say hello. You know, we, we obviously, this was a super important conversation. Um, and at least the ability to say hello. I mean, we may be able to plan something like this again. Um, but I would love to be able to have some St. David's people at least say hello to some Church of the Resurrection people and Resurrection people say hello to St. David's people at least to uh, put some names and faces to it. So that'd be great. Okay, good. I'm going to push breakout. We're going to break out into rooms and there are going to be about six or seven people there. And I invite you to talk for, you know, the next uh, uh, 15 minutes or so and um, uh, 20 minutes. And uh, then we'll come back as a group and wrap it up. Okay. So your groups are, um, are forming. Okay, everybody who's left, it's Pat, Tilly, Sandy, there's, uh, there's Onika, uh, let's see, Don Walker, Kristen, Jake. Um, all you need to do is just click the button that says I'm gonna join, and that way you can join. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, there you go. Don Walker, that's, uh, that's you. You'll just have to push a button, Don, to... Uh, <clears throat> to join. And Onika, I think you just have to push your button there too. There you go. And uh, yep, Kristen did it. There you go. Hey, Onika, how are you? Okay. Onika, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Anika? Hello? Yep, can you hear me? Onika, can you hear me? Let's see, I see you looking around your computer there. <clears throat> All right, and hey, Chris, uh, hey, Chris, hey. I was in a small group with one other person who was on a phone and they were muted by you. Are you able to? All those phone people are muted unless you hit unmute. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, that's not always the case. Sometimes, no matter how many times I hit them, I can't unmute them. Um, can anyone hear me? Right. Well, uh, sometimes if they mute themselves, then you can, then you can't unmute them. But if they were muted by the system. Yeah. Um, uh, Onika, yeah, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, I think it was user error on my part. So I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Go go ahead and um and pop into your room. I think you just have to hit okay. the join button in order to go. And you're in room three. Okay. Um, I'm looking for the join button. I don't have Noah with me to help me. So. Oh, yeah. okay. Let me let let me right. see. I can move you to room two. Okay. Um, but yeah, you have to hit join in order to make it work. Okay. So let me. I'll look around for. Oh, I see breakout rooms. I mean, I mean. Okay. So I got it without okay, knowing. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. And uh, Heather, you're with, uh, what does the phone number end in? Oh, can I they just, know. can they just not talk? Is that it? I mean, maybe they're just not listening to their phone or it just says mute and, they, and nothing's happening. It says mute. And so I was talking, 
but which, I would which, uh, which breakout room are you in? I don't know. Five, six. They may be gone now. I mean, because I was like, I'm going to try to get you unmuted, but. Yeah. Um... That's fine. I'll just hang out with you here. I mean, it's not a big. Oh. <laughs> I think we lost a bunch of people too. I know. That's, that's fine. That's fine. Um, yeah. Well, thanks. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, maybe it was breakout room three. Let's, uh, we'll put you over there and see what happens. Uh, there's one other phone there. You got to hit join on your end. There you go. Hey, Denise, are you there? Hello, Denise. Hola. How are you? How are you? Oh, I'm muted. Uh, no, you're unmuted. I unmuted oh, you. Okay. Hey, do you um, want to go into one of these breakout rooms? Sure. Okay, right. you, you just have to hit um, join in order to do that. Oh, that's easy. Here you go. Okay. Was anybody there, Heather? Uh, they were there, but the, they either couldn't, didn't talk to me or, you know, I said hit star six, right? Because I think that that's the thing. Okay. okay. Are we still live on Facebook? We are still live on Facebook. I could probably stop that at this point. Um, let's 